Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here. Now before we begin, I'll thank all my members, my commanders, David Reeves, Jeff Hallam, Martin McConville, Captain's Quarters, Miami Jules, and Jean-Luc Martel. I'll also thank my Centurions, Nathaniel Mead, Arian Fulton, Pendleberry P, and BOS Domestic Dispute. Now if you join at the Centurion level, you will get and you will get access to all sorts of artwork, including phone screens and screensavers, all that kind of thing. Thank you very much. Right, today we're going to be talking a little bit of something, something that's been weighing on, my, weighing on my mind for some time and, you know, now seems like the perfect opportunity to jump on it. Um, and that is how Lower Decks makes Old Trek, as it's, as it's known, look new. Um, it's a, you know, series that is set in the TNG era and uses the TNG aesthetic and really spruces it up. Yes, I know it's a it's a animation and so that does kind of confer a little bit of flexibility, but the the extent to which that is so is is actually quite minimal, especially when you talk about the the ship shots, the external shots of the ships. You know, it's just something I want to talk about and you know how I think Lower Decks has done a great job of of bringing new trek forward because you can if you go back and you look at particularly uh before it's been hd re-rendered there are some kind of dated elements to old trek uh ship footage so obviously it is based on the tng aesthetic now this is interesting for stars because the cerritos is i haven't done a ship chat on it yet i will but i need to work out what all the bits are because i'm pretty sure the nacelles from a Springfield, but the saucer is round, so it's probably an ambassador saucer, but that doesn't scale properly, so leave your thoughts on that in the comments below. But it's got that, one of the big things that TNG brought in was a big use of colour, particularly in the, now we associate it more now with um, blue and red of the nacelles and then the, the silver, the st- the steel grey of um, the grey steel of the Enterprise and the highlights of the nacelles, as well as the glow of the deflector dish, though that's not quite as colossal as it will later become. That's actually quite an interesting thing. The TNG deflector dish is actually dialed back in the level of its glowiness. It more corresponds to actually the motion picture deflector dish, and you know, makes some sense. Um, but that's kind of what people think of when they think of TNG. But actually, if you look particularly early TNG, and it's something I kind of wanted to subconsciously hint at with the Cardassian Border War series, is that there's a lot of um, scarlet, actually. They don't go full red. They go to a sort of a a darker, reddy, purpley scarlet. And you can see that also in like the interiors as well, actually. Um but it's a very 80s aesthetic and like I say it's been brought forward and it's been kind of more um the colors have been more blocked they are more specific and that is a very modern lighting style i suppose you'd say we have blocks of clear color they don't there isn't the blending there's a lot of blending and i'll talk about that particularly when it comes to the interiors but also the the ent- the look of the enterprise throughout tng actually evolved obviously they tried to play with the lighting a little bit but there was only so much they would do cuz they could do cuz they were shooting a studio model uh, as opposed to where you can now have dynamic computer engines dynamically light things i'll get onto that particularly if you look at some of the um early model footage in season 1 particularly one of my members brought this up on the discord and it was actually because a giant i think 6 foot model then they went down to a four foot model and then they went down to a two foot model um as the series went on because they were the smaller models are easier to film but obviously you get less detail so why the enterprise is so bright in season one it's just glowing with windows is because it's a giant model it also seems to get a lot more blue into the hull which I, i i really want to bring up because um that is actually reflected in lower decks. Before we get to that, I'll just go through the rest of the aesthetic evolution because then we go to Deep Space Nine and actually we do get a bit of a darker shift in the ship's colours. But the hull colour, again, particularly for things like Defiant and 
Akira, it seems to take a more dull tone and seems to go down again. I think it varies according to the lighting more, but it seems to incline more towards gunmetal. I might also be conflating it with like CGI uh, re-renders and retraces. Um, but there is certainly a darker look with those newer ships. They also bring in far more glowing uh, deflector elements. And you can see that in the Akira, in the Defiant, and the, well, now in the Titan. But we'll get there. But the deflector dish is gro glowing, becomes more and more of a thing. So then this really brings us up to date with Discovery. And I want to talk very quickly about the lighting in Discovery Season 1. Um, because it's, it's, in many ways, it's very impressive. In many ways, it's also very annoying. Because one of the things they they allow the lighting to absolutely dominate the ship. They don't give you good views of the ship. They actually have it heavily lit. Uh, and on one level, it's very good. It's very, you know, impressive. But it also, you know, means you can't always see the ship properly. Um, they also made an interesting choice. They made the ship in season one made it bronze which makes for some very different lighting options it's also and i think that's also partially why it looks so different is that they've plated they've not only are they lighting and they're doing all this modern stuff and they're doing all this modern styling this that and the other you can you know go back and forth on that all you like but it's bronze it's a bronze starship and we don't really we've never really had bronze starships so and the closest you have is some 22nd century ship, which have more of a burnished look to them. But to have a full bronze starship, and that dictated the way they did lighting. It was much more dynamic. You know, objectively very good. It just was quite jarring. It's not what we're used to. Now this brings me to Lower Decks and how it gets lighting, I think, right. The Cerritos. What colour is the Cerritos? What colour is the hull of the Cerritos? Now... You might say, it's, you know, standard Starfleet Grey. No, it's Starfleet Cobalt. It's actually close. It's actually quite close to how the Enterprise appears in early TNG. It has that bright cobalt shine to it. It's very vivid. And then, of course, you have the blue that kind of blends into that and highlights. And then you have the red that contrasts. You also, of course, with all the California-class ships, have the yellow stripe or the, the coloured stripe, that again further kind of contrasts and lifts that colour. You have obviously the dark, some darker elements put onto the uh, hull. They don't go for, it's interesting, and again, maybe it's because it's drawn, because they do do it in Discovery, but they don't do it in Lower Decks, because the Discovery, along with every, uh, well, everything since the Enterprise D, has Azteking. Uh, obviously they don't have that on the Cerritos, they have, it's just a clean look hull, and that's probably just a product of the animation style, that you just don't have to have that level of uh, detail. Whereas y you do kind of need that to reinforce, to show the, the plating, the literal plating on the hull. Um, but yes, it's, it's cobalt and it glows blue and red. And also the deflector dish now glows. In fact, all the deflector dishes in, dis in Lower Decks glow and really add a lot of life to the ship. That's something I think that is taken primarily from um, the first contact ships. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, they kind of went backwards in the next generation films was giving the Enterprise E a yellow deflector dish, which it's an interesting highlight. It's an interesting difference, but it kind of looks a bit dull, doesn't draw attention. And actually you can see in some of the promotional material in some promotional material, you can see that it does have, it was going to have a bright blue deflector like everything else. Um, but I guess because they wanted to have that sequence on the deflector dish in First Contact, they had to tone it down a bit, which I think is a bit of a shame. But yeah, it was a cool sequence, so give and take. Uh, they could have refitted a new blue one, and I think that would have looked great, particularly on that dark hull Enterprise E. And then, yeah, all the other ships. Again, the uh, Titan has a very glowing deflector. It basically has the deflector that the Enterprise E should have had. And then the Parliament class, the Vancouver, again, has that TNG style. Both it and the Cerritos have the TNG style deflector, the Enterprise D style deflector dish, but with more of a glow to it. 
And actually, the Vancouver is a good example. Again, it's a dark cobalt. When that really brings out actually particularly the orange, the orange red in the nacelles and in the buzzards, it really lifts the ship and gives it a very energetic feel. So, why am I bringing this up? Well, because it's something that I've felt like the community is actually there's been this almost convergent evolution between how the community or some areas of the community in the art community have done Star Trek artwork, and then how now these uh, new shows, particularly uh, Lower Decks, are taking it. And that's the emphasis on the colour, particularly when you compare it to other franchises. If you look at the original footage, by modern standards, the colour is quite dull. Uh, Just compare, you can compare side, a great example is compare side to side the... um, Sacrifice of Angels remaster, right? The purple of the Dominion really comes out. The blues and the greys of the Starfleet ships and the metallic look comes out. The gold of the Cardassian ships really comes out. That's something that I'm, and that was something I wanted to get onto. And this has basically been an excuse to get onto, is because it was a bit of a revelation for me. So obviously, Long-time viewers of you will know that I did the series on the Cardassian Border War, and I had two 3D models made by the wonderful Rizal 3D. She made me two 3D models of some obscure Beta Cannon Cardassian ships that I wanted to use in the series. And um, it was a bit of a revelation, because the way they were illustrated, and they had been in some games, particularly older ones, but they hadn't, you know, had a modern incarnation. And, you know, then we get the model... And we get the renders, and they're gold. They're gold, or they're bronze. They're burnished bronze gold, and they're very, and they perform very dynamically in different lighting conditions. If you take the, if you take them into a sort of a dark red, kind of setting of very you know burning colours of dark red and orange, those Kardashian ships kind of become very dark and bronze and you know imposing. And then if you take them to a, a brighter lighting condition with like blue light or white light um, and, you know, sort of something a bit more icy, a bit cooler, um, you get gold ships. You get these gold Cardassian ships and it's just absolutely wonderful and it breathes a new life into them. And that's something you can see, obviously, in that Sacrifice of Angels remaster, but even more so because you're you're interacting the colours. And that's something that uh, that I have, as I've been making these renders and such, I've become much more attuned to is the importance of interacting the colours and getting them to um, mesh together. I think it's incredibly important and it makes a huge difference as to how it all turns out. It can just look absolutely beautiful. And, you know, it was really great to see the Cardassians in... um, lower deck season two and for them to have that level of vibrance it was a bit more flatly lit the sequence um again it's another example of that opening sequence of you know they took a miranda and they just tngified it if that's a word but you know they they gave it you know blue and red glows and it it spruces the ship up and frankly that's how i in my head canon that's how they probably wanted to show the not just the Miranda, but the Excelsior during the Dominion War. Again, those are things that you can see have been done in the fandom. There are loads of fan uh, fan art of that kind of TNG-ified versions of Mirandas and Excelsiors, and they just look wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Excelsior is another great example. It's actually um, of that movie-era aesthetic. I'll probably do a whole series. Let me know if you want. I'll do a whole series on the aesthetic evolution of the various eras, because that's a distinct era in itself. Getting back on topic, I'll also just very quickly touch on the use of interiors and uniforms. There's in quite interesting, there's a big contrast, particularly now we see it in series two, between, uh, the Titan interiors and costumes, and the uh, Cerritos costumes and interiors. So the Cerritos costumes and interiors are very heavily based on that of the Enterprise D, very bright and open. But it's interesting; they've actually changed it. They have incorporated a bit of JJ Trek into it. They, they, it's more. There's a lot more white and light colours 
to improve the kind of dull look of the corridors. Uh, the bridge is very bright and, and lightly coloured as well. So there is that, and it helps, but what it does is it really brings out the colours in the various uniforms. They also have, of course, the white stripe across the top now. It's essentially the TNG uniform with a white stripe across the top, and that helps bring out the brightness in the various uniforms and then contrast and also kind of, you know, makes them more noticeable against the... the uh, particularly when you have the dark trousers as well against the uh, sort of light grey slash white ship interiors. Um, and then that brings me to the Titan very quickly. We haven't seen a huge amount, but I think we've seen enough to say they've got the darker wartime uniform. And this is an interesting thing that I'll get on to at the end. The colours are more muted and it's, it's much more you know, military. And the, the ship's interior reflects this. It's darker uh, more browny and reddy and dark, and you can kind of see that again reflected in the Enterprise E, but also the Defiant. Defiant scenes are actually quite darkly lit compared to the bridge of the Enterprise. So I think that's very interesting. And it's an interesting thing because, again, and actually it's something that seems to be shown in recent episodes, is that there's actually this kind of division. There's almost these two fleets in Starfleet now. You have the, uh, the TNG Starfleet, of the, uh, you know, of the Cerritos and all the California-class ships. And then you have the Deep Space Nine, you know, Dominion War Starfleet, like the Titan, and so on and so forth, which is much more militarized and, and is stylistically, they're very different. It's, it's, it's a very interesting thing to ha put these two eras side by side, and it is almost, it does kind of feel, I was saying... Um, it does almost feel a anachronistic in, in many respects, uh, given that it is set in the 2380s. So, you know, it's meant to be post-war, but it, it doesn't necessarily feel the most post-war thing. It feels quite, uh, you know, certainly when you're on the Cerritos, much more TNG. And then the Titan, much more Deep Space Nine and the movies and so on and so forth. So, but I think you kind of see the best of both worlds in these um in this use of this in the use of this so what i would just say is that like i think lower decks has demonstrated that you don't need to like reinvent the wheel and you don't need to you know have everything redesigned to look modern and stylish you just need to spruce things up just recolor it just bring it up just lift things up you don't need to go and again this was something that came out with the that it was again the case when they did the proper D7 in Discovery. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Just spruce it up. Just you know, give it a little bit more. Make it pop on screen. It's 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 a solid design. There's the look is solid. You just need to kind of double down on it. Make it look as good now as it did back in when it showed. It's kind of almost the thing. It's almost it's a lot like um, for those of you who play Halo. The Halo 2 Anniversary Remaster, unlike the CE Remaster, which is janky and weird and strange, it looks like a different game. This, the 2 Remaster is just pro pretty much how people saw the game back when it came out. And you want to just do that with uh, New Trek. It's just there shouldn't be this kind of disconnect. I think that's how you do it. And I hope that this is the lessons that they take from... Uh, lower decks and the the positive response that it seems to get from the community. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. It is good. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of TNG style fun. If you don't, I know a lot of people don't necessarily like adult animation. That's fine. But just appreciate the ships just in their own standalone thing because I think they're great additions to the Trek universe. So uh, thank you guys for watching. Make sure you share your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.